So as you see, the title of this course is Interactive Formal Verification. Um, it's mostly about how to use Isabel, which is a system that I'm a developer of. But I will try to keep it a bit broader than that. So from time to time, I'll try to mention things that are relevant to interactive formal verification in a more general sense. So other systems, though, in particular, COC, you may have heard of. You may have heard of the whole system, which is developed here, and so on. So I will try and keep it a bit more uh, general. Now, why do we do this? At least originally, this kind of already seems outdated, actually. Certainly, the main motivation for all of this work had been, still maybe is chiefly, about bugs in systems, in computer systems. All right, I don't need to introduce bugs. One of the interesting things, uh, I was interested to learn how many critical bugs are never fixed. In particular, you've all heard of regression testing, right? So regression testing is when you're about to deploy a new system and you run through all the checks of all the bugs that have been fixed before, just ensuring that none of those old bugs have been reintroduced. Um, and in general, when you're about to deploy a new release, people would be very worried if they saw a bug that they hadn't known about, and particularly if, if they can then check, okay, well, they have the previous version available. If that bug was not present in the previous version, then this is a, a, you know, a non-starter. So they're very worried about introducing new bugs, um, but somehow the old bugs can stick around for quite a long time, even some quite serious ones. They don't get fixed because it's too expensive to fix them. This again is actually is a very old point, this thing about avionics trying to meet the standard of 10 to the 9th failures per hour. So maybe 20 years ago, um, somebody did a study into what's involved in attaining such a high reliability rate. And the point is, clearly you can't do it by testing, not an operational aircraft, you know, for obvious reasons. Um, and clearly Boeing didn't do the right sort of testing with their uh, 737 MAX or whatever it's called. Um, one could argue, and of course we here, if you're in this course, presumably you think verification might be a good idea. Um, strictly speaking, one can't even necessarily argue, at least convince a skeptic, that even verification can achieve this um, degree of reliability. Now, we think it should, because if you prove a thing, it's true, right? But as we all know, there are ways that errors can creep in, because, for example, a specification is a mathematical entity, and it's always an approximation and abstraction of the real world. So one could imagine that verification will also prove insufficient. But anyway, this is one of the reasons um, why people employ verification, is to try and, and meet these very high standards, which are not at the moment, well, which are presumably inherently incapable of being done by testing, because in a 10 to the 9 failure per hour, how many billion hours do you need to test before you believe that you've um, reached that, that level of reliability? Um, I did want to say another thing, but I don't remember exactly what it was. Oh, yeah. Um, so this is a little cliched in that we have in the past always talked about safety critical systems. The reason we talked about that is because the human life, you could argue, is of infinite value. And therefore, we can set aside the cost of doing formal verification because in the past it has been very expensive. Now, a funny thing has happened, namely, the cost of formal ver verification has plummeted. I can't give you any concrete uh, numbers on that, but it has plummeted. And as a result, you are seeing formal verification used in a lot of places which are not at all safety critical. For example, Amazon Web Systems, they use a lot of verification there, and, and it is not used 
Uh, it's not controlling aircraft or ambulances or any of those things. It's simply a product deployed by Amazon, and they would like it to have good reliability. So you see, we, are, although in the beginning, I feel like this is historical motivation, we're concerned about safety critical things because of the cost. The cost is coming down. Anyway, so by interactive proof, um, sorry, I'm being very critical of my own course. But this is what my slide says. It says, proving things in an interactive formalism, um, precise definitions, form of blah, blah, blah. All that is true. I, I seem to have left off with the word interactive here. So everything on that first column actually applies equally well to what is what called fully automatic proof or fully automatic verification. And actually, um, given that interactive proof, it is proof that involves human effort, um, will certainly cost more than any fully automatic thing. Uh, if you can do a thing fully automatically, that is terrific. And there are indeed many fully automatic uh, verification tools, uh, notably um, model checkers. You've maybe come across model checkers somewhere. Other things called SMT solvers, for example, which is a type of fully automatic theorem prover. They, they do incredible things. And all the things in this first column apply to them as well. That is, we're using a formal, logical language in which the notion of a thing being true or false is absolutely precisely defined. And we use some kind of algorithms in order to identify the things that are true in this. Um, and clearly, the reason some of these systems are automatic is because they're not clever enough. But there's more to it than that. So you could say, OK, your system is automatic because it just can't prove things, but I have a better fully automatic system that proves all those things. But we can do more in an interactive theorem prover because you are able to create, to, to edit and build specifications. So you have a thing that starts to look like a program development environment um, where you are starting to write specifications. Now, no automatic theorem prover is going to write specifications for you because by the very nature, a specification is what you want. And unless they can automate mind reading, it's not going to figure out what you want. So with your interactive theorem prover, you can write these elaborate hierarchies of fully um, formal fully mathematical specifications of both perhaps the requirements for your system and maybe something about the physical, not physical, about the logical design of your system as well. So you can have all this stuff formally specified and then you can start forming, start formally proving the relationships among these entities. And indeed, sometimes I say interactive theorem provers should actually be called something like specification editors, because then you would get more of a feel of what's really going on there. And especially, I have to say, a lot of theorem provers, a lot of interactive theorem provers, are not very good at actually proving theorems. Certainly the early ones were generally pretty crap at proving theorems, but they were still pretty good at this role of creating your hierarchies of specifications. OK, now let's go and just enumerate some of these. So for example, there's um, Isabel, which is what this course is chiefly about. Um, the whole system which was developed, I was about to say here, strictly speaking, it was developed in the old building, which is now called the David Attenborough Building. But it was a very grim thing called the Arup Building when we were in there. And Mike Gordon, who died a few years ago, had the, uh, use, had the great idea, I mean, I'll go more on this later, of using higher order logic to verify hardware. So we're going to see a glimpse of that later in the course. So that was a, turned out to be a very successful system, which now exists in many versions. Um, also under higher order logic, I've lifted listed a thing called PVS, which is popular in the USA and in particular in NASA. It's not exactly higher order logic. It kind of lives in its own world, but some of them do. 
As for constructive type theory, and there are a lot of type theory guys hanging around here, I don't know why. Uh, type theory seems to have been in, it, it was actually kind of in in the early 80s, and it's still in um, with some people. So you may have heard of Cox. There's Lean, which is a new system that's got a lot of people excited. There's also Agda, which also seems to have people excited for some reason. They are quite different from Isabel in a number of ways, chiefly in that they have this, first of all, this type theory, which is a typically a constructive formal calculus, so you do mathematics quite differently. And they have a lot of stuff built right into the formalism Whereas in the higher order logic, most of these concepts, let's say recursive functions and recursive types and things of that sort, would be derivable from a more primitive logic. Finally, there is a thing called ACL2, which is very much sort of out there by itself, um, very important in its own right. So it is quite different from all the others, but one has to mention it. Um, simply because these guys in Austin, University of Texas, Austin, who built this, who were among the first pioneers of, um, they saw it as automatic in their day, but it wasn't really. It needed a lot of hints, and so it fits in the interactive world now. So here are, this is what you see on this slide, is most of the m important interactive theorem improvers. <coughs> now, I want to mention this LCF architecture, which is the basis of some of the ones on the previous slide, most of them actually, but not every single one. Oh, by the way, you say, what the hell is LCF? It's one of those many acronyms that has lost its original significance. So if you really want to know, it stands for uh, logic of computable functions. Um, that doesn't matter. By the way, are any of you Lisp fanatics and want to know what car and coder stand for? Now, nah, that's another generation. Forget I said that. Um, so when people say LCF today, they're not thinking of logic of computable functions, but rather the architecture for a theorem prover that was developed in around 1979 by Robin Milner and his colleagues including Mike Gordon, at Edinburgh. The point was, if you're building a piece of software that is claiming to prove theorems, how do you know it's actually correct? Because as we know, software contains bugs. That's the whole point of this. And if you have a huge amount of code, um, by the way, don't ask what huge meant in 1979. If you have a kind of not entirely trivial amount of code, um, it could have bugs in it. So they had the idea that you could make a very small kernel in which the actual theorem proving part was isolated, and only that kernel had to be trusted. And the way it worked, it finds that people seem not to understand for some reason. So I, if you are looking at printed notes, uh, you will see this. I added this this morning, in fact based on this idea of abstract types. So you have a typed programming language. In fact, they invented their own programming language so they could do this, the language which they called ML and which now lives on in languages like OCaml and standard ML. Um, so they invented ML simply so they could build their interactive theorem prover, which they called LCF. This language included the notion of abstract type. By the way, is abstract type still a common thing understood today? How many of you have heard of an abstract type before? Oh, not that many, one or two. So it's a bit like, if you like, a, a something like classes and object-oriented programming. But the crucial point being, it would have to be the sort of class that you can't extend or look into from the outside. And I'm afraid I don't know enough about Java to know if you can even do that. The point of abstract type is that you are creating an, an environment in which you're implementing a data structure and from outside you can use the data structure but you can't tamper with it. In other words, the only operations you can do on the data structure are the operations it exports. And it does not export um, low-level things that allow you to do anything you want. In other words, you have to 
use this data structure only in authorized ways. Now, in the case of LCF, and this was Robin Milner's great idea, um, let's say that these authorized operations will simply be the valid ways of proving theorems. So if you've had a logic course somewhere, you know that a typical logical formalism has some axioms, a list of axioms typically, and some inference rules. And the only way you can prove a theorem is either by picking out some axiom and saying, I want this axiom, or you can take an existing theorem that you have built and apply a rule of inference to it, and that gives you a new theorem. So this and those things together are your inference system. Those things together give you exactly the set of theorems uh, allowed by your formalism. So Milner said, let that, let's encapsulate that in an abstract type. And at that point, we have created a safe way in which other users can call this thing. They can write whatever code they want. Their code can be full of bugs, and a lot of bad things might happen. It might run forever, blow up the computer, whatever, but it will not ever cause this kernel to output something that is not a valid theorem. Now, there is an obvious alternative to this, which is still used today in many systems, and that is store the proof tree. So why not simply store the proof tree? Um, well, when he tried in an earlier version of LCF, he ran out of memory. Now you say, yeah, but that was in the 70s. We have lots more memory today. But also, our proofs are lots bigger. And we find in systems that like to store the proof trees, they are still running out of memory because you can have 16 gigabytes, which I have on my nice machine upstairs, and you can still run out of memory if you just fill it up with crap. And, and believe me, proofs are big. So the whole point of this architecture, well, two things. One, simply to minimize the amount of code you had to trust, and secondly, to eliminate the need to store the formal proofs at all. But they are, you know, the, the design of the system already ensures that invalid proofs cannot be produced. I'm sorry I talked so much about this particular point, but I've been amazed recently at even some quite, shall we say, highly qualified and intelligent people who struggle to get it. And if I had a written exam, which I don't, um, I would ask about it. OK, uh, what is the next line here? So this is continuing from what I've been saying. If you write your own fancy algorithm to prove theorems in some incredibly clever way, it needs to go through the kernel. That means if your algorithm has a bug in it, it might crash. But nevertheless, the proofs um, should be OK. Now here I say unsoundness is less likely. Why didn't I say impossible? And that's because I'm a computer scientist, and anyone who says there are no bugs in my code is an idiot. Right? OK. Uh, the downside, um, because you are forced to prove everything using the listed inference rules of a logic, some things become more difficult. In fact, if I'm allowed an aside, one of the things Mike Gordon did with his whole system, which has the same LCF architecture, uh, in fact, it's basically a hacked version of LCF. He said, I want BDDs. Do you all know what BDDs are? Uh, I'm not sure you do. Well, let me just, in a few words, a BDD is a very sophisticated data structure for Boolean logic. Um, so sophisticated, you can put in a Boolean logic problem with tens of thousands, maybe millions of logical variables, and this data structure kind of compiles them up into a very kind of minimal truth table for that big formula, which if it's a tautology, and often you're checking for a tautology, if it's a tautology, it just comes out as true. And you can do all sorts of cool things with BDDs, but what it is doing is not um, easily expressible using uh, normal rules of a logical formalism because it's you know, a very clever data structure with sharing and all that kind of thing. And if you try and do it directly using logical rules of inference, you will lose the main advantage of BDD, which is their terrific speed. Um, 
So Mike Gordon did an interesting hack to his Hall system in which he basically added the BDD primitives to the proof kernel itself. So that suddenly BDD operations were also supported by the kernel. So that is the kind of thing one might do. Now you wouldn't normally like to do this because you say, what is the point of having a kernel if you then tinker with it and add stuff to it? But it was a very cool experiment anyway. Okay, I should get going. Let me finish this slide. So who uses this LCF architecture? As you can see, um, many of today's systems, typically um, all the ones coded in some version of ML, use this LCF architecture. Ones that aren't, PVS, God, what? Yeah. PVS is in Lisp, I think? ACL2 is certainly in Lisp. In fact, ACL2 is written in its own language. So the language of ACL2, the actual formalism it gives you, is a functional fragment of Lisp, and it's written in the same language. So it's a very clever but slightly weird system. OK, let's move. So I'm repeating myself a bit. So if I have a theorem prover, what do I have? I have a logical formalism. I have some way of interacting with it. So I have some sort of user interface or language. Uh, and this can vary. So Isabel has a quite nice kind of uh, interactive development environment. In fact, if you read the documentation, you see PIDE sometimes. That's something like Proof Interactive Development Environment. Um, in others, you might interact with them simply from the top level of the ML programming language, which is fairly crude, or they might have some other language where you might interact through Emacs, things of that sort. Another thing that you would find in almost any automatic theor sorry, in any interactive theorem prover is some sort of automation. The reason we need automation is because any proof in a purely logical formalism, well, the lengths are simply colossal. Even to prove simple things, you're talking about very often thousands of inferences. So you need automation. Um, even the very first version of LCF had a quite s sophisticated simplifier, for example. What else? Libraries. Um, now, funny thing, thinking historically, in the early work on Hall, the only libraries they had were the natural numbers, so they didn't even have negative numbers and negative integers, and Booleans, because they were interested in hardware. But pretty soon, people needed the real numbers in order to talk about floating point. And then once you have got floating point, might want to talk about an implementation of the exponential function, and then suddenly you're starting to need some at least elementary calculus, and eventually it builds until, well, the formalized libraries that we have now are really quite big, maybe not by the standards of a mathematician, but um, things like, you know, the prime number theorem, the Jordan curve theorem, lots of other really advanced results in mathematics have now been formalized in people's systems. And you need these. So even if you're not interested in formalizing mathematics, and that is a current, if you like, niche application, um, if you are doing anything involving any real world application, let's say it's about sound or audio, maybe it's about um, as air travel or trains, anything involving the real world is going to involve something to do with you know, engineering mathematics and therefore some fairly advanced mathematics. Another thing you might have is things to help you, if you like, utilities, like for converting your work into a paper, because I'm an academic, right? So whatever you do is worthless until you get it into a paper. Um, other things like to search in your libraries, etc. So here again, this is like common to all of theorem proving systems and not just to Isabel. So what about Isabel? Um, so as it says, uh, Isabel is generic. Generic means that it is, in theory, applicable to a lot of different formalisms. The reason for that preference was that in the 80s, when I started working on it, 
there were a lot of formalisms floating around, and nobody knew which would be the thing. And in fact, one drawback of the LCF formalism is that your actual logic is hard-coded into this proof kernel. As I said, you're writing each inference rule as a kind of access procedure of an abstract data type. So you're writing a lot of code for your formalism. If then, you know, two months later, someone says, this is the formalism for us, then you've got to code it all again. And it does seem like um, you're making a whole new system just because you edited one part of it. Um, so that was the original intent, but then higher order logic came along and took like almost all the verification world with it. So the generic part is not so relevant anymore. Um, so what do we have? So why do I think Isabel is great? Well, there are some reasons here. There are some really very good automation. In fact, the automation was always my thing, even from the very earliest design. Um, simply because I'd used LCF and I thought the automation sucked. So, and indeed, whatever you build later on in the world, there's no point building a product for somebody else if you don't eat their own dog food, as people like to say. Eat your own dog food. You will not be building a thing that someone else will have much value in. Counterexample finding. This is a cool thing. So most of the things you're trying to prove are not even true. And it's great if the system can actually say, whoops, um, that statement you just made is falsified under such and such circumstances. It's incredibly useful. Code generation. Um, this is a kind of weird thing. The idea is that although higher order logic is a mathematical formalism and it is not executable, there is nevertheless a subset of it that looks an awful lot like a functional language, and you could imagine turning it into the apparently equivalent functional code and then running it, and in that case you would have a, basically a verified code. Um, and this, there's a whole murky world here, which in fact I'm not so familiar with myself, and this is especially if you want to have efficient imperative execution. Uh, have any of you heard of things like monads and Haskell and the way you get imperatives? So I see some yes, some no. Um, so there is some of this in the Isabel library, so some stuff based on monads, which I believe provide a basis for cogeneration that includes things like destructive arrays. Uh, and clearly there is some scope there for verifying traditional imperative algorithms that don't have efficient equivalence in the functional world. And LaTeX, I talked about LaTeX before. I'll skip over that. Okay, so what's higher order logic? And here again is a generic, sorry, I don't use that word, a general piece of knowledge that you can take away from the course, even if you end up hating Isabel, because higher order logic is a very important formalism. It's basically first-order logic plus functions and sets. The interesting thing, and where I think um, Mike Gordon was really very clever, who that was back in the 80s when he was looking for a way of verifying hardware and stumbled across higher-order logic. Now, it had, it had been around for a long time. Logicians had invented all kinds of formalisms. But the reputation of higher order logic was a down there on the floor somewhere. Now, if any of you have got maths degrees and have studied first order logic, you know that it satisfies lots of famous theorems like, I don't know, Schroeder Leuvenheim and compactness and blah, 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 completeness. It's got all sorts of beautiful properties. Um, and so that was the th formalism of choice for most mathematical logicians. And you might say, OK, then higher order logic is no good. That's certainly my idea back then. But of course, for what Mike wanted to do, all those theorems like Skoll and Levenheim were of absolutely zero relevance. The great thing about higher order logic is exactly what it says. You have functions built into your formalisms and sets built into your formalism. And as it turns out, you can express an awful lot of things using those directly in the formalism, and in particular, 
all of the hardware stuff that he wanted to do, he could code very easily. So I mentioned, we will see that, I guess it's the 11th lecture, we'll look at how he did that in a bit of detail. Um, higher order logic has a type system, which I think even in the original paper by Church, dating back to 1940, you had a hint of something like polymorphism there, although the word didn't exist then, at least not in the logical meaning. Um, it has, in particular, a type of truth values, which means that we can quantify over Booleans, which you can't do in first-order logic. So terms and formulas are the same syntactic thing. But finally, the actual, because you have lambda expressions, so higher-order logic is kind of includes the lambda calculus as a subsystem, so you can do what looks like functional programming, uh, at the way you would in ML or Haskell. It, you can kind of give yourself the illusion that you can write code in this formalism. Yeah, and I said popularized by Mike. And the slogan, by the way, at the bottom, I think, is due to my colleague Tobias Nipko, who's in Munich. This idea of functional programming plus logic, it's a great slogan for understanding why this formalism is useful. Um, now, just to repeat myself, you'll find this formalism not only in Isabel, but in the whole system, um, arguably in PVS, and to a lesser extent, kind of echoes of it are in the type theory-based systems as well. Okay, now I have to get to more user manual type stuff, which is going to be a little dull, but we need to know how to use Isabel if you're going to. So if you're going to write a formula in Isabel, Strictly speaking, Isabel Hall, because we're going to focus entirely on the higher order logic part of Isabel in this course. You can write things like this. So these are your typical um, logical formulas. Uh, I hope you've all seen formal logic somewhere else. So as you can see, we have equals and not and 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 or and implies, um, if and only if. Now the thing is, these ugly ASCII representations shown here aren't what you should normally use. So nowadays, Isabel supports some nice-looking mathematical symbols. But the easiest way to input most of these beautiful-looking symbols is by typing the ugly ASCII that is shown on the slide, and then the GUI will automatically try and convert it into the nice version. So you'll get, if you play around with it, um, do, everyone has their own laptop, right? Anybody not? Okay, for whatever kind of laptop you have, as long as you've got I don't know, at least four gigabytes of memory at a bare minimum, you could download Isabel, whether you're Windows or Mac you sh or Linux, you should be able to do it and probably get it running. But if you can't, we do have, and we, I think we still have a terminal room in use for the MPhil, uh, and it should be installed there. And you could try it out. Uh, you know every fourth lecture of this course is not really a lecture. It will be in the terminal room, and we will try stuff on those terminals or on your laptop, and I will sit around um, trying to help you without getting in within two meters, and I'm not sure how that's going to work. Okay. So just, to, I'm sorry, this is more boring user manual stuff, but you need to know that when I write a quantifier with a dot, if you can see the dot there after the x, that is very typical of the notation used in interactive theorem provers, and it means that the scope of the quantifier extends right to the end, respecting any parentheses. The reason I point this out is because if you look in any logic text, you will typically find that quantifiers have a very tight precedence, but also they will write the quantifier without the dot. So the dot, in fact, is a weird bit of syntax that goes back to the start of the 20th century. Uh, I won't bore you by going into tremendous detail about it. Um, but anyway, just remember, if you see a dot in a quantified formula, the scope is big. And I think all of our interactive theorem provers that I'm aware of give quantifiers a big scope. Um, in Isabel, this thing really throws people. The, the quantified formula on the right, you would argue, why do I need parentheses when the quantifier starts the formula? 
Um, and you would be kind of perfectly correct about that, but you would not convince the parser. And I'm afraid the parser is the boss here. So the, the, if you like the syntactic rules, the, the parser, let me put it this way, Isabel's parser does not work left to right. If you like it as a holistic, it doesn't know anything about orientation or direction. It just, and so it doesn't actually see that from left to right um, it should be obvious. Um, okay, this thing about implication, this is actually the way you want implication to, ne to nest, that is to the right. Uh, and because we do it for implication, we do it for and and or as well, though you would never notice. Okay, and this one, because this is higher order logic, the equals sign, when applied to Booleans, is an if and only if sign. Um, and so you might be tempted to write something like this that's shown on the last line here, but if you do, note that the equals will be treated as an equality between B and C because that's how the precedents work. And in fact, if you want an if and only if symbol, there is one, so it's the same, same logical meaning as equals, but it has a much lower precedence so that you can write logical equivalences the way you'd like to. I forgot something. Can I fix this very quickly? What I forgot is this. Um, how can I do this? What I forgot is this. Everybody needs Dilberts. Right, I'm sorry, I forgot that I always, I always have this problem there. And there's probably another one coming up. Because we're really going to know, there isn't, that's the only one. I'm so sorry. Because otherwise it gets a bit boring. Uh, some of my lectures have two Dilberts. Okay, I need to move on with this kind of user manual stuff. So, terms, um, higher logic is built on the typed lambda calculus. Has everyone seen the lambda calculus somewhere? Okay, so the lambda calculus is key to languages like ML and Haskell. So everyone really needs to know to have at least the idea of applying function applications and lambda abstractions. Um, now the really weird thing in Isabel is the thing in red there, the flexible variables written with a question mark. So they are, if you like, the key that makes Isabel different from most other systems. Um, these are placeholders for a term you haven't thought of yet. So when you're doing your proof, um, when you're doing your proof, like if you're trying to show that there exists a, th a thing with a certain property, when you peel off the existential quantifier, you will get a formula that has one of those things in it, one of those flexible variables. The point being that that variable, and you didn't know what thing satisfied the existential quantifier, and you said take off the quantifier anyway. And the point is that if you had known what to put there, like let's say zero, or f of zero, or maybe something complicated, if you'd known what to put there, you would have put it there. But if you don't know what to put there, you can leave this thing, and later in the course of your proof, it might get filled in for you. So if later you have to prove that this question mark x is equal to zero, then bingo, you've solved your problem. The thing, it should have been zero all along. So it's a way of, if you like, delaying the, um, the choice of something that you didn't happen to know. It's quite useful when you're interactively developing a proof to have these things. They are sometimes called existential variables. Um, the only other thing that you need to know here is, of course, we have lambdas, which is the obvious meaning, and you can write function applications without parentheses, if you like, rather as you would in ML or Haskell. <coughs> then terms, you also have the typical language of, for example, mathematics, so you have um, 
addition, multiplication, and all that kind of stuff. Things to do with sets like union and intersection. Anything else you might happen to define. So if you're doing analysis, you'll find that sine and cosine logs and so on are available, and so on and so on and so on. OK, something about the type system. Um, every term has a type, and these are simple types. Anyone here know cock, actually? Or lean? Nobody? Interesting. OK. Um, so the types here are different from the types in cock because they are simple types. That is, they do not have. Um, for example, an integer as an argument. Types are built up only from other types. Now, we have polymorphism, as in Haskell. And has anyone seen either Haskell or ML? I see. That's good. Um, so you then know what polymorphism is, the idea that you can write one piece of code that has, if you like, multiple meanings. And because we have type classes, I'll only say a bit about type classes in the course, but it means you really get a, a non-trivial idea of multiple meanings here, or you might have an operation like less than, which means one thing on natural numbers, another thing on strings, say, to stay in the programming world, yet another thing on, I don't know, sets or lists, and so on, and somehow you can prove certain theorems about less than without even knowing which of those things you are interested in or you are talking about, because you're working on the level of the abstract properties of an ordering and not on a particular instance for a particular type. And that is really cool. We have type bool, which is simply the type of formulas. And because we do classical logic, the only Booleans are true and false. We also have the kinds of things you'd expect in any functional language, ordered pairs and indeed records, though records are a bit of a mess, um, and function types, natural numbers, integers. In fact, we have reals, complexes, even quaternions, actually, if you're interested in weird things. OK. Now, how do we do things with pairs? Again, I'm awfully sorry about this user manual sort of stuff, but this is partly inherent in the course and partly also in the nature of the beginning of the course where I'm trying to get you to a state where you can actually do stuff. Um, so we can write ordered pairs using round brackets. And by the way, yes, my eyes are really seeing that cross. And I'm not sure you can actually write that cross. I think you might have to type an asterisk. I would have to actually check. So an asterisk, as you would in a programming language, is more likely what you're going to get there. But maybe the cross is allowed as well. And this is, of course, the normal thing. An ordered pair has a product type. We do not have n-tuples as their own entity. So n-tuples are merely nested pairs. Um, as I said, let's forget about record. I mean, the record package is cool, but it's a bit, you have to be determined. Function types, well, um, one thing worth noting is I hope you all understand the notion of currying, a curried function. Maybe you had a curried function sort of in Haskell or ML. So the infix operators are all naturally curried. And the reason for that is because product types, that we saw product types in the previous slide, but they were not, they are not a primitive of higher order logic at the lowest level. So we actually, in the buildup of the higher order logic kind of base system, start with an extremely primitive formalism and extend it with stuff. So we actually add in binary products later on. But the function types are there from the very beginning. And things like plus and this logical conjunction are, in fact, curried functions. Um, but once we have defined the binary product, and of course, it's, it's defined in the system for you. Please don't imagine that you have to do this yourself. It's like a vast thing which you start, uh, take as your starting point. Um, 
you can, in fact, write, to look at this last line, a lambda with an argument in round brackets. So this is actually saying that the argument type will be a binary product type, and this is a kind of primitive pattern matching. Clearly, you know, if you know ML or Haskell, you, you've seen pattern matching in functions before, and so we have some bits of that also in the logic of Isabel, and I think in other interactive theorem provers too, they try and do this. So I know the whole, in fact, I think I did this for LCF and kind of kept it along with all the other systems I had anything to do with. <coughs> Excuse me. No one can cough anymore. A bit about arithmetic and natural numbers. Um, so in particular, suck is the successor function, right? n plus 1. If you're mathematically inclined, you might want to write n plus 1, but please don't, believe me, you will, you will regret it. Um, it's because the simplifier really wants things to look like suck, and it will transform things into suck for you, and then basically things will go very unpleasantly for you. Um, as a general rule, yes, you shouldn't fight a system. So you see we have um, all the operators listed there, and I should mention we are very mathematically oriented, so the whole body of developers for Isabel, and there have been many, many by now, so you might imagine at first that div operates on integers or natural numbers or something like that, but I think they have been developed in some very general algebraic sense so that something is a God knows what integral domain or whatever, um, to the point where, I mean, the nice thing is you could prove a thing about div and it might be valid for all these types like natural numbers and integers and so on, but it does all get a little more sophisticated maybe than some of us might want to see at any particular moment. Um, so we have the integers, rationals, reals, as I said, complexes, quaternions, even things like non-standard reals. So there's a lot of cool stuff. Um, and indeed, if you're looking for um, an MPhil or Part 3 project, you might want to do some sort of development using this big library of stuff if you like maths. I think I put suggestions on the project web page. And, of course, we have tons and tons of properties of these types, you know, formal properties. Okay, now I want to say a little bit about higher-order logic as a functional language. We've gone to a lot of effort to make it look like you are working with a programming language. And once again, the other systems like Hull, Hullite, Cock, probably Lean, do something very similar. They also try and give you this illusion. And indeed, these constructive type theory systems like Cock, their actual logic language is a kind of functional language in its own right. There's a, a significant difference between the way they do logic and we do in the higher order logic world because they have an executable language at their core, which we do not. So anyway, uh, you might recognize in the first line something that looks a lot like what you could write in ML or Haskell. So here we're defining a data type of, list, of lists. Don't try this, by the way. The reason it won't work is because lists are already built in, so you'll get an error message. Um, but if you were in a world, we for some time actually had a version of Hall without lists simply to run this example, but that's kind of stupid. Okay. Uh, and then if you want to define, for example, an append function, so the second thing you see here is an append function for lists. It's the standard definition of list concatenation that you must have seen in a functional language course. Uh, and you'll see it's written with two clauses, as you would do it in, in Haskell or ML, um, with pattern matching. So you see that there are two lines for append, one with nil and one with cons. Um, and they do the obvious thing, as they would in, in ML. And again, the next function there, which is rev for reverse, written as the obvious code in a functional language. And you can write this also in Isabel, and this is going to be a higher order logic function definition, and it will, in this case, be executable. I should stress, it's very easy to write stuff in higher order logic that is not executable. 
called it, it's a general logical formalism. Now, we're going to look in later, uh, what I'm doing actually in this first lecture is going through very quickly a lot of stuff that we're going to see in much more detail later on. So, for example, here is an example of a proof by induction. We see a lot of things here, like the word lemma, saying we're declaring a lemma. The word simp, informing the simplifier that this thing is becoming available. Um, a command to do induction, a command to do automation, something, a word done to indicate the end of the proof. So all this stuff will be elaborated on um, starting on Monday. This kind of proof is called an apply proof for, I hope, a really obvious reason that we see two occurrences of the word apply, which is like a list of commands. But we also have structured proofs. So you see there are no applies here, and instead we are writing a thing that's which has a kind of visible structure that you can see. It's the same proof as before, incidentally. I mean, mathematically, it's proving the same statement, and the actual internal logical proof is the same. But now we've written it with a different notation in which the structure of the induction has been written out a bit more explicitly. Um, this will, looks a lot nicer. Uh, and also, it is easier for somebody who's not familiar with your system or not familiar with, uh, you know, with, with why your proof is correct. So the problem with a list of applies is it's pretty inscrutable once you have like 30 of them in a row, which you can easily do. Whereas if it is a structured proof, you will have not only the nesting, but you will also have these intermediate lines in which you state what you're assuming at any present moment, and that makes it all much easier to read. Um, so this then has been a very quick introduction to a lot of stuff in Isabel, and we'll be seeing more on Monday. Um, and that's it for now, so thank you for coming. Any quick questions before I switch off the recording? Yeah? Um, that bit where you need uh, parentheses, even if the, uh, like... With a quantifier? Yeah. Do you think of that as like a deficiency in the parser, or do you think it's a, just a consequence of the good idea? Like um, it's a very sophisticated parser. It uses the early algorithm if you come across that in the compiler course. Um, and I think it's a small price to pay for what the parcel lets you do. You can define your own notation, you see. You can introduce uh, all kinds of things and give precedences, and it can deal with even syntactic ambiguities. It can return multiple parse trees and type check them, and if there's only one that's typed correct, it will let you get away with that. Um, so on the whole, I think it's worth it. Okay. So thank you all. Now wish me luck here. <laughs>